As I was saying earlier, that's what happens when you let a 12 let a guy with a 12 letter last name pick the title of a presentation. <laughs> so we're going to talk about an innovative approach to improving patient access using lean methods and predictive analytics. Uh, I'll get the framework started and then Jamie Bachman from UC Health will come and describe how uh, that is actually applied. So a quick uh, introduction, who are we, what do we do? We're a Silicon Valley software company and our expertise comes from two areas, lean thinking and data science. Uh, prior to starting Lean Test seven years ago, I led McKinsey's lean manufacturing practice in North America, and then in the late 90s created McKinsey's service operations practice, which is the idea of taking lean thinking from manufacturing and supply chain and apply it into service environments because unlike manufacturing where a widget is a widget is a widget going through an assembly line, a patient in an encounter with a provider doesn't quite uh, apply one for one. So uh, we applied that thinking. What occurred to us was organizations that do lean do it on the backs of Excel spreadsheets. And at the end of the day, Excel is middle school math. It's add, subtract, multiply, divide, and a few functions the, uh, you know, uh, to boot. It doesn't quite lend itself to solving the kinds of complex problems. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to increase the effective capacity of the health system. And if you increase the effective capacity, more patients can get seen, and they wait less. Why is that uh, challenging? To do that, you need to do two things. You need to optimize the scheduling to get the demand for services and the supply of capacity to line up. And the second is, you need to have predictive visibility. You need to know what's happening today, tomorrow, next week, not what happened yesterday or last week. And unfortunately, most dashboards, most systems about capacity reporting are backward looking. The if you boil it down, the, the core problem is the following. Health systems have thousands of scarce assets, whether it's operating rooms, uh, infusion chairs, doctors, MRI machines, etc. They're so busy and overbooked that you have to wait weeks and months to get an appointment. And when you get an appointment, you have to wait. Yet the average utilization of any one of these assets, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., is less than 50%. Operating rooms are 50%, infusion chairs are 60%. So it's a bit like struggling for months and then paying thousands of dollars to get a Super Bowl ticket and then showing up at the game and half the seats are empty. That, why is it that it's so busy but I can't get in? So that's the core problem we go after. So how do most health systems deal with it? They typically use one of three strategies or three of three strategies. The first one is build, build, build. New buildings, new facilities, expand it, add people, run longer hours, etc. That's great, it helps meet the demand, it puts capital and human resources at work. The problem with it is it takes uh, months to get uh, this per buildings permitted, designed, and, uh, and up. It obviously puts a lot of pressure on budgets. And finally, it just is difficult to keep throwing people at the problem. It's hard to hire people, train them, onboard them, there's a shortage of nurses, of providers, et cetera. So the, Build, 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 even for big complicated systems, starts to kind of run out of steam after some time. The second approach people use is let's rely on the HR because we've spent the best years of our life and several hundred million dollars putting it in place. By God, we've got to get something out of it. Um, and to some extent it helps because it's a single source of truth. You've got one database of every encounter between the patient and the, and the health system. And it gives you a repository and a data warehouse from which you can report on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So all of that feels great. The problem with it is the EHR as a system of record is an aircraft carrier. It's got all the data and it can go in one line. You, it's not a speedboat. And operational optimization and analytics requires a speedboat. So try as you might, you're not going to get the agility and the insight at the level of detail we're talking about, and I'll show you what I mean by that. The, the core thing, the reason why that happens is twofold. EHRs look backwards, not forwards. They're giving you yesterday's data, last week's data, and there's only so much you can do rear view mirror driving. And the second thing is they are better equipped at reserving resources, not optimizing them. So it's a I'm going to reserve this uh, exam room. I'm going to reserve this infusion chair or this operating room at this time for this patient. So it's a reservation system. It's not an optimization system. The third approach people take is let's launch a big, comprehensive, lean, Six Sigma, 
you know, flavor of the, of the year uh, program across the organization. Virtually every health system has got one or two of these uh, that have launched. And it's great in many ways. It engages the entire workforce. It's got a discipline about it, making metrics uh, cascade. The leadership goals start at the top and ripple all the way through. That's all terrific. The problem with it is, one, it consumes an enormous uh, amount of labor and time. So if you just add up all the person hours that go into it, it's a really big number. The second is, despite having it in place for five years and six years, it's incredibly fragile. If two key senior leaders quit, poof, it's gone. It just, the, the entire thing unravels. And what happens over time when you start hiring more and more people, the new people are never uh, fully on board as to why are we doing this. It becomes this set of mystical rituals of we walk to the wall, we look at this metric, we you know, go to a tour, we draw fishbone diagrams or whatever the uh, exact uh, systems might be. It just creates, it takes on a mythical life of its own that has no bearing to what, uh, what's really happening. And as I said earlier, it relies on basic algebra and what we're trying to do cannot be solved with basic algebra. So those are the three kind of uh, things most systems do. So let me step back and say, what does it take? If you're gonna try and really drive operational excellence to get uh, the kind of improvement we're talking about. First is, so there, there are five keys to it. I'll spend 30 seconds on each one now and then a minute or two on each one uh, after that. The first is velocity. Speed matters. Excellent service processes are fast processes. If you encounter a slow process, it's not an excellent process, no matter what anyone tells you. Second, the demand profile of patient arrivals is not a God-given thing. You can shape the demand profile. We bend every other beam that exists, whether it's light beams or proton beams, we can bend a demand beam uh, if we needed to. Third is, health systems are the most complex, interconnected, network of things, right? Everything depends on everything. Labs on pharmacy, pharmacy in the clinic visit, clinic visit on or, uh, imaging, imaging on something else. And so you get this spaghetti which is very difficult to unravel and all the dialogues lead to analysis paralysis because you just cannot uh, pull them apart. So the trick is to start small and, uh, and optimize. Fourth is you have to coexist with the EHR. Like it or hate it, it's not going anywhere. You have to learn how to coexist with it. And finally, the math is real, you have to invest in data science. The uh, kind of sort of quantitatively agile doesn't cut it. I'm an engineer, I'm a computer scientist, I thought I knew math, we built a data science team, I now realize I know algebra and arithmetic, they know math. It's a, it's a completely different thing and I'll show you what I mean by that, okay? So let's, let's take each one in turn. What's fascinating about velocity is service processes are always horribly, horribly efficient. Typically 15% efficient, 20% efficient, compared to manufacturing processes which are 80 and 90% efficient. Why is that? If you look at the elapsed time, let's take a typical clinic visit where they block an hour. If you then said, all right, there was a check-in and they, they uh, got their vitals done, they were placed in a room, they talked to the provider, they did their wrap-up. Each of those little things took 10, 15 minutes. The value adding time, meaning a caregiver and a patient connected and engaged, talking, measuring, doing something, is often 10 out of those 60 minutes. The doctor talks to the patient for two minutes. The vitals take all of 45 seconds. So 10 out of the 60 minutes is value adding. So 50 out of the 60, the patient is cooling his or her heels waiting for something to happen. So the, and this is true of any service process. If you think about 30 days to get a bank loan approved, you'd be hard pressed to find five hours of work. It's 10 seconds to run an experience credit check. It's 30 seconds to run a title check on the house. It's one hour to walk through the house. You walk through all the line items, you'd be hard pressed to find four hours of work out of 30. So the 29.6 days are spent waiting. What this leads to is process improvement looking at the wrong thing. Often process improvement looks at trying to make the act faster. Let's automate it, let's train them, let's get, up, get better people. Even if you made the act twice as fast, You'll take the 10 minutes down to five, the 60 will come down to 55. The leverage is looking at the other piece, right? We're trying to take this gray down by half. So you have to look at what's not adding value, not what is adding value, which is, a, which is an inverted thing. Second is take this demand curve. Everything in a health system is peaky and volatile. Labs peak at eight o'clock in the morning, 
you know, pharmacy peaks in the middle of the day. So you've got all these ups and downs. Inpatient beds peak Tuesday and Wednesday of the week. So whether your horizon is the week, the day, or the hour, there's stuff that's uh, up and down and peaking, right? The thing is, you can bend the demand curve. You don't have to accept it as is. You can forecast it and you can bend it. Uh, following 9-11, uh, I got to lead the team that redesigned Atlanta Airport. You could not change the security processes because the National Guard was running the airport. But what would happen is, it started taking three hours to go through security. So people started showing up four hours before their flight. It started taking four hours to go through security, so people started showing up five hours before their flight. But this is a race to the bottom that's not going anywhere. You can change the process, and this is what people are doing. So what did, you do to change, you know, what did we do to change the demand profile? We put in a simple rule. Someone at the head of the line that looks at your boarding pass and says, if it's more than two hours away from flight time, we're not letting you join the line. Too bad. Suddenly, there's no upside to showing up four hours before your flight, because you know you're going to get to the head of the line. They're going to kick you out. So you might as well show up two hours and 10 minutes before your flight. And suddenly, a third of the people who were trapped in the system got taken out, and you could make the process work. So you can shape the demand curve uh, quite clearly. It's like I just lost this. Yeah. So what you do is you forecast it, and then you start flattening it. Peaky profiles are not your friend, no matter what. Because if you take a peaky profile at rush hour, everyone going home at the same time, that's what creates the mess in the first place. So rather than accept a triangular profile, you have to flatten it. So what does that look like in, in uh, practice? So Jamie will cover this in greater detail. But infusion uh, treatments, if you thought of the length of the brick, like a Tetris game, where long bricks are eight hour treatments and short bricks are one hour treatments. Invariably, this is the profile with all the holes in between, which leads to the peak. When you get to the peak, the wait times go through the roof. So what do you need to do? You need to find a way to fit all those bricks in a tight spot. And as appointments come in, you steer them into the right place. So we'll talk about what the mathematical complexity of that is. But once you do this, suddenly, in any given slice, you've got the exact right portfolio of patients in the chair, right? Think about the fact that today, a scheduler talks to a patient one-on-one -on -one and negotiates a appointment time. That's like you talking to a stockbroker and getting a negotiation on what stock to buy without disclosing to the stockbroker what other stocks you hold. Obviously, the advice is gonna be wrong. They need to know what else you hold. Similarly, when a scheduler gives a patient a spot, they need to know what other patients came right before, right during, right after. And that's not doable. Right? This unlocks capacity when you do it this way. And it helps even out the workload. So lots of goodness comes from it. We'll, we'll talk about it in a little bit. Back to this notion of uh, everything dependent on everything. When things are so interconnected, you have to fix the nodes before you fix the edges. That's just a rule. So if you think about UPS with thousands of warehouses around the world, they worry about the warehouse operating productively on time with a high quality pick before they worry about whether the drivers fast or, uh, drive fast or slow. So you have to fix the nodes before the edges. So what you have to do in this context is get every one of these things running better to where it looks like this, right? So think about JFK Airport in the 60s. It only had 200 flights a day. Today it's got 5,000 flights a day. The airspace around New York hasn't changed. They haven't added 25 times the number of runways. So how did they increase capacity by 25x? They may have added 2x or 3x of runways. They got more synchronized. All the supporting services worked in unison. The baggage handling, the fuel loading, the crew, the passengers, the food, the plane servicing, the taxiing, all of that synchronized, smooth, and at tight intervals. Takeoffs every 90 seconds, not every 20 minutes. So that's kind of what needs to happen to a, to a health system in terms of uh, how you start in one piece and optimize. We talked about coexisting with the EHR. Changing the EHR is like rewriting the Constitution. That's not going to happen. So you might as well accept that that's the way it is. And so how do we coexist with it? First is pull data out. To the extent you don't need patient-sensitive data, don't take patient-sensitive data. That makes the EHR guys much, much more relaxed about it. Now you pull it out, and you run your optimization over here and find a way to put it back into the EHR. That way you don't have to train the staff to learn a different system, learn how to use optimization. It needs to be invisible. All of us know how to drive a car, none of us know how a fuel injector works. So somebody just goes in and makes the engine smarter, that's great for everybody. You don't need to uh, you know, force everyone to learn how a fuel injector works. Right? 
So it's a lot like dialysis, right? Take the blood out, purify it, put it back in. So that's kind of how we think about leveraging the data. And then finally, do all the analytics, forward-looking, et cetera, off the lean uh, optimization. Right. Last, last point, why is the math crazy? So I gave you the infusion example. Take a very simple thing, 35 chair infusion center, five types of appointments, about 40, 60, 75 patients a day, that is the number of mathematical ways in which it can be arranged. 10 raised, so it's 106 zeros behind it. To put this in context, the number of gallons in all the oceans put together has less than 30 zeros behind it. So there is no chance this is happening on an Excel spreadsheet, someone's laptop, uh, a nurse or a scheduler drawing a little placemat on the wall. It, it's not happening. It's worse than a needle in a haystack. So how do you make the data science work? There's really four steps. One gets smarter about prediction algorithms. The looking at trends and drawing lines through Excel variate regression doesn't do it. You need some pretty serious prediction. You then optimize. So that's where you run all the constraint-based optimization algorithms to make it better. You then deploy it back in the template, back in the spirit of coexisting with the, uh, with the EHR. And most importantly, you have to learn. Optimization never works the first time. You need machine learning algorithms that get smarter about it. So it's a bit like having a thermostat with a dial on, where the dial has its numbers rubbed out. If you wanted to get 71.2 degrees, you're not going to see it on the dial. You've got to get it generally right. And uh, once you get it generally right, you, uh, if you're a little cold, you make it hotter. If you're a little hot, you make it colder. And you finally converge on the right answer. So you have to build in machine-based learning into it. We've done all of this and of deploying it in four different settings. Uh, infusion centers, operating rooms, inpatients, and clinics. And so I'm going to have Jamie come up and talk about what's going on at uh, UC Health with it. Thanks, Mohan. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Bachman, and I'm the Executive Director of Oncology Services at UC Health. I'm going to start by playing you a quick video to introduce my organization, given by our Chief Information Officer, Steve Hess. UC Health was formed in 2012 by the University of Colorado Hospital, the state's only academic medical center, Poudre Valley Health System, and Memorial Health System, two strong community hospital systems. Today we have five hospitals, 1,620 beds, 16,000 plus employees, 2.6 million ambulatory visits, and 3.1 billion net revenue. When we were formed in 2012, we moved fast to standardize and consolidate our IT systems. The philosophy is that we needed common IT platforms across all of our care areas to enhance the collaboration and common clinician and patient experience. We are live with the Epic Enterprise Electronic Health Record across all UC Health locations, along with Philips, PACS, and Lawson Enterprise Resource Planning. We have a lot of capability, including advanced analytics and processes to pull the data out of our EHR, learn from it, and create clinical decision support interventions and build them into the operational flow of the transactional EHR. With that enterprise EHR, the advanced analytics, a strong clinical informatics program, and a good process for incorporating learnings in this transactional system, we can tackle many issues. But solving the more complex healthcare operations processes is not trivial, and the advanced solutions we have in place are just not enough. We have brilliant physicians, excellent clinical and administrative leaders, good process improvement capability. These complex problems take more than just people. To really move the needle, we need very advanced algorithms to highlight specific opportunities, and we need the ability to connect that machine learning to actionable change. This is where LeanTOS fits in. They combine advanced machine learning with process improvement mindset with actionable interventions that are easy and intuitive to hardwire. They connect the dots between the data, the learning, and the sustainable change needed. They can do in weeks what takes us as an organization months, if not years. So we're a young but growing system, and we span the entire state of Colorado, seeing millions of outpatient visits each year and hundreds of thousands of emergency department visits and inpatient admissions. Steve's team of IT professionals has done an incredible job of leveraging technology to help us make better clinical decisions and improve our business processes. This happens in the form of consolidating to one health record uh, and other systems to drive our business processes like Lawson, et cetera. 
they do a great job of consolidating the information and using it to make those decisions for our providers who are caring for our patients each day. They pull that information out and study it and help us learn more about that care delivery. But as much work as they've done and as good as they are at what they do, they know and they realized early on that they didn't have the technology or the talent to solve some of these problems around demand, uh, bending the demand curve. So that's where Lean Toss came in. I'm going to spend a few minutes today telling you about our specific experience as it applies to an infusion uh, center setting in a cancer center. The University of Colorado has a comprehensive cancer center uh, in its Denver campus. Uh, we're designated by the National Cancer Institute as comprehensive and we're members of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. We're the primary site across the state for treating cancer patients of all types, and we have multiple infusion center settings in our Denver campus and many others across the health system. We, like the rest of the University of Colorado Health System, have grown tremendously over the last four years. And so we responded with the typical responses that Mohan described. We extended the hours of operations, starting earlier and ending later. We added weekend services, including treatment of chemotherapy, 362 days a year. We started to build new facilities and add chairs to places that were already in existence. But the simple fact was that no matter how many times we did that, we struggled to meet our patients' expectations, and that came in the form of extensive wait times and inability to add people on uh, last minute when they had clinical needs. Obviously, that's not what we're trying to do. We need to increase our access and get people in when they need the care into our centers. So what we did was working with the machine learning and data and analytics provided by LeanTOS and supported by structured process improvement, we applied it to our setting. We evaluated data points going back a very long time that had to do with duration, complexity, and types of chemotherapy delivery. Based on those evaluations, we understood much better about what other people coming through for similar services would need as it related to time and complexity. The algorithm told us what we needed to know about how our schedules were planned to be versus what they should be planned to be. And so, as Mohan described before, we pulled all of that information outside of the HR, evaluated it, and once we knew what it needed to look like, put it back in the form of templates. We layered that with things like daily huddles showing how we performed yesterday and learning from it so that we could do better today, as, as well as, and probably more importantly, understanding what the rest of the day would look like as we did these daily huddles, predicting when we'd run out of chairs, when we'd reach capacity, so the nurses running these infusion centers could actually respond in advance for things they could expect to happen based on some of that historic information. And this is actually our real data, taking it from that triangle curve that we discussed before and flattening it out into a near, a near trapezoid. Now the results were actually fairly impressive. We saw uh, our ability to meet the demand through extended capacity grow fairly substantially, um, peaking out at 85, whereas before it was 73 people per day where we would actually run out of chairs again because we're piecing those uh, Tetris blocks in the right spot at the right time based on people's arrival and departure times in advance on purpose. Now you might think that this is happening because we squished them in very early or very late, but in fact, we saw the most substantial service performance improvement in the middle of the day, which has classically been the worst time for not just our center, but really any place that's doing this type of thing around the country. All the while, the waiting time of our patients went down by nearly 16%. The staff satisfaction was up. Patients tell us that they enjoy it. So all in all, even with balancing metrics, uh, this is going quite well. So where do we go from here? Well, first and foremost, we're starting a project to take it from these first 34 chairs in our main uh, academic site to all of the infusion centers across the state of Colorado. We'll complete that project sometime in the early summer, and we'll use that to make all of those infusion centers much more efficient and much more effective. But what, I, what I'd like to do is actually spend time on a couple of other projects that we're just launching with LeanTOS around other scarce resources, specifically inpatient beds and our operating rooms. So imagine a patient's journey into, through, and out of a hospital. They come in four classic ways, through an outpatient clinic, perhaps through an ED visit that they were brought to by an ambulance, perhaps they had a surgical procedure that was scheduled in advance, or maybe they were transferred from another hospital. You might imagine that people come through 
they're recovered, they're admitted to an ICU bed, they maybe go to a floor and then they leave. Now, we have so much information from people who have gone through this process over time that if you look back and take, for instance, a complex surgical procedure, we have thousands of data points telling us when all of these movements happened, how they happened, where they happened, so that when the person with a similar condition, similar diagnosis comes through tomorrow, we actually know with some specificity what to expect. So what's that mean? It means that instead of having an emergency where we run out of beds and have to turn people away, we actually know in advance and can help people move through the system much more quickly and precisely. It helps us plan for those things and move things like elective procedures to an hour later, a day later, a week later. Instead of having havoc on the spot, we understand what's going to happen and respond to it in advance before it becomes a crisis. The second place we're starting to use this is in our operating rooms. So the 38 main ORs around the system are beginning this actually this week through a project that we're launching with LeanTOS. Um, and ultimately will scale to all of the 100 plus ORs that we have in our system. We know through studying this that the utilization of all our operating rooms is very low. And the overtime used to keep them staffed is fairly significant. Our expectation is that doing three things are going to help us drive towards using them more efficiently and more effective while maintaining or possibly even lowering our use of overtime to get there. First, we start with the utilization dashboard. To Mohan's point before, having the information in front of people is actually quite important. Sharing transparently the data with physician providers and staff that support them drives behavior, gets them to understand what's happening around them, and actually is a bit of a call to action, but it's simply not enough. We start with the next piece, which is smart block scheduling. So actually, moving the blocks of schedules, which typically in a hospital setting happen, say, on a half day or a full day basis, to adjust based on past performance and past utilization. They'll adjust like our infusion center schedules did to what we saw our performance through our patients uh, coming through the centers and they'll continue through this machine learning and data and analytics to get smarter over time so it wouldn't be just the first pass. We'll continue to make these more precise and adjust which is what brings us to the most exciting thing that we're showing now. It's called mobile block exchange. If you think about the way that operating room time is managed today, it's the equivalent of buying and selling commodities on the floor of an exchange. Hand up, I can take this, you want to give me that, let's trade operating room space. It doesn't happen very often effectively. People miss times to trade and it just doesn't uh, give the providers and staff that support them the ability to actually work together. If you're lucky, you might have this happen once or twice. So what we're doing is actually taking an Uber-like approach, matching the supply of an open operating room for whatever reason with the demand of someone who needs it, whether it's for a new schedule or an urgent case, to actually match those up on the fly uh, using this technology so that the physicians can self-manage that. And again, it will continue through the smart block scheduling to learn over time to make it even more effective. I'd like to turn it back to Mohan now, who's going to get into the detail of what that actually looks like. Great. Thanks, Jamie. So let me pick each of the three uh, pieces that Jamie's described and uh, show you what that looks like. UC Health is our launch customer, so this product is now launched and running at UC. We start small and scale up to cover uh, all of the 109 ORs that, uh, that Jamie talked about. So piece number one, the utilization dashboard. Uh, as is very clear, dashboards are necessary, they're not sufficient. You cannot expect your local football team to win the Super Bowl just because you erected a new scoreboard in their stadium. That's, that's not going to do it. So, but at the same time, giving people visibility on a timely basis uh, allows for better decisions. So what we're doing is surgeons will get on their mobile phones on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Initially weekly, we'll push it to daily at some point. Through their text browser, they can get into it. What they can see is what their utilization was for the immediately preceding day or week. They can look at how they stacked up against other surgeons who had uh, block privileges for the prior week. This creates the right gamification of it because people didn't become surgeons by not being competitive. They are quite competitive in their demeanor. And if they periodically know they are 12th out of 14 on the leaderboard, they will tend to do something about lifting the block utilization. Fourth is, 
to the extent that they want to drill down and say, why is it that my utilization was lower? They can drill down and then start to see whether it was because of late first case starts, whether it was insufficient uh, surgery schedule, whatever the issue was, they can figure this out. So all this is getting pushed to surgeons in a completely unobtrusive way. They don't need to download an app, they're just getting it as a mobile browser thing. Meanwhile, the administration is equivalently getting pushed uh, on a daily, weekly basis uh, how the overall service line did or how the overall operating uh, set of operating theaters did, uh, who the each block owner, how they performed, where the first cases were going late, you know, all of that sort of stuff they can, uh, they can uh, take care of. So that part is the visibility part. Module two that Jamie described was smart block schedules. So back to how do you get to smart block schedules? There's a demand side of the equation and a supply side of the equation. On the demand side, it is very hard to forecast how many surgeries a surgeon will need to do. Why? Because a high percent are elective. Uh, whether a surgery happens today or next week more often depends on the patient's ability to get the rest of their life in order to come in for the surgery than the surgeon's capacity. So how do you predict? The, the key is two things. You have to be a little more elastic about your definition of time. So you're not trying to predict surgeries to the minute. You're trying to say over the course of the next month, how many procedures will this surgeon do? And the more elastic you become on time, the more accurate your forecast can be. Second, you have to abstract away the forecast. Forecast. You cannot say how many elbow surgeries will they do. Well, that'll depend on how many people break their elbows over the next month. There's, there's no real way of uh, predicting that. What you can do is abstract all the procedures that a particular surgeon does into duration buckets. One hour procedures, two hour procedures, three hour procedures, four hour procedures, and be able to say, looking at it, we predict they will need 15 one hour procedures, 22 hours, and 40 four hour procedures over the course of the next month. Armed with that, you can have a very good forecast of what, uh, what happens. On the supply side of blocks, you've got uh, the current block schedule, blocks that are underutilized that you're gonna take away from surgeons, as well as blocks that are voluntarily released. Now you make the supply demand match with math by anchoring it in what surgeons would prefer in terms of some surgeons operate on Mondays, do rounds on Tuesdays. You have to factor all of that into account because trying to change a lead surgeon's schedule through the course of the week is also a difficult thing to do. And you've got to figure out how, which surgeons are deserving of more time and which surgeons are deserving of less time. That's again a difficult thing and it's typically done in a very manual, committee-based, opaque model of an OR committee that meets once a month and a chief of surgery who talks to four people, you know, ten times a week and, and works through all of that. You've got to make it an algorithm. So how do we make it an algorithm? We build machine learning into it. The simple rules of if it's more than 60% utilization, give them more time. If it's less than 40%, give them less time, don't work. Because they depend on the day of week, they depend on the type of surgery, et cetera. So what we do is we've used a classification algorithm where imagine you've got all the surgeons who are licensed to practice or have permission to practice in your facilities. You define a set of rules, and the rules can vary by health system. So this health, Colorado in particular says, all right, if the surgeon's growing at a very high rate, let's make sure we give them more block. Green means candidate for more blocks. If they're using a lot of block time and they use a lot of overtime, give them more blocks. Um, if they happen to be senior chair of the department, give them more blocks. And conversely, if they're not using it well, give them less blocks. So when you come up with these rules, turns out only a small subset of your surgeon population will fit very clearly black or white against these rules, which is great. You classify them that way. And then you use machine learning, which says, now that I've nailed down this small subset, let me look at the rest of them and since they don't qualify against one of the rules, let me see who they most resemble, kind of most like. This classification of algorithms is a lot like when you rent a movie on Netflix, it says you may also like. It's quite sophisticated. It shows you five choices. You probably will like two of those five. So it's got a 40, 50% accuracy and it gets better over time. So then you classify the remaining and you're able to then get pretty fine grained. Initially, with a seed set of 38, we couldn't classify 17. When we ran it through the second round, we could classify all of them, and in fact, get fine grained about A's and A minuses, B and B pluses. How is this used? The administrators decide who gets more time and less time. So the way the whole thing comes together is you start the historical, you do the smart forecasting, you do the utilization, get the surgeon request, get the composite score, run the optimization, create a good block schedule 60 days out, learn from it and make it better, learn from it, make it better. What this does is moves the needle on utilization. 
just to put this into context, every point of utilization, meaning you take it from 60% to 61%, is worth $100,000 per operating room per year. So a, a typical hospital has 10, 15, 20, so it's a million dollars. A large system has 100, 200 operating rooms, it's 10 and $20 million a year from getting the math on this right. So it's certainly worth chasing. Uh, the Uberization that uh, Jamie talked about, rather than go through the whole, uh, I realize I, I've got a block on Mondays, but five Mondays from now I'm at a conference, so I'll try and find my buddy, someone on my service line, get my coordinator to go find somebody. That's a very inefficient process. Uber, like, imagine if I could just release it. Say, yep, I've got a block on that day, I want to release it, done. Now it's released. How do I accept it? Initially, you can be very simple-minded. You can say first come, first serve. So you send up a flare to everybody saying, hey, there's a block now up for grabs. And the first person who gets it notif notices there's a block, grabs it, says, okay, I want it, and confirms it, right? Over time, you could get more sophisticated. You could start to say, let me release it to my highest performing surgeons for the first two hours. Because I'd like to give it to the highest and best user. If no one takes it, I'll open it up, give it to the next batch of surgeons, the next batch of surgeons. All of this can be done seamlessly, and it becomes a lot like boarding an aircraft. Platinum's board first, gold's board second, and it, it still all works. So that's also uh, live at this point. Where we are with uh, UC Health is it's launched across the 38 ORs. We're going to expand it over the next uh, 109. Let me, so that's, that's it. I'll stop for questions, either for UC Health or for us.